We are delighted today to be speaking with Brad Parks, who is the Conservation Education Director for Washed Ashore or the Washed Ashore Project, which is a, uh, a very interesting approach to raising awareness of plastic pollution through artwork. And in, an installation of 13 sculptures will be appearing at the Tennessee Aquarium beginning on April 16th and lasting through October 30th. So if you want an easy way to remember that, that's from tax day roughly to Halloween. Walk us through the origins of this project. When and why was the idea formulated to create you know, massive sculptures made from plastic items? Washed Ashore started with our founder uh, in, in the south coast, the southern coast of Oregon um, 11 years ago. As an artist, she began to see plastic really littering the beaches um, and Oregon's coast is phenomenal. So to see non-natural things, I mean, we're used to driftwood and shells. Of course, we love to find shells, but um, finding all the plastic that she was um, discovering made her desire to do something uh, with this and make an impact uh, and really raise awareness of this issue. So thankfully, more people are aware of it now. But at the time, it was something that was really relatively new in our consciousness that this amazing invention was now sort of coming back to haunt us on places that we hold. So um, true for most of us, peace, peace and tranquility and relaxation and not pollution uh, is a spot or something you, you really consider when you think about the beach. And so <clears throat> fast forward, we now have collected with volunteer help. Our, our organization is uh, really beholden to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of amazing volunteers who help us from cleaning up the beach. So they actually pick up the trash help us process it so things need to be cleaned and, and safe to actually work with. And then uh, we even have volunteers who help with pieces of the art that like a quilt sort of go together to make these incredible, supersized, gigantic, um, whimsical yet realistic sculptures of marine creatures who are threatened by the very plastic that we're depicting them with and being collected off the beach. So 35 tons of plastic have been collected in 11 years, yeah, 35 tons, from mostly from around, if I, and this may be, there may be an update to this, but the last I'd heard it was around 30 some miles of beach in Oregon. Um, we do have some park rangers who are awesome at pulling uh, things for us, but largely um, they have gone into 85 sculptures, uh, as you said, several of which will be at Tennessee Aquarium this spring to really highlight this issue and bring more awareness to the community of Chattanooga and the folks who love the aquarium um, to really see their connection to this issue, even though you're far away from the ocean. As the conservation uh, education director for this project, um, obviously you're concerned a lot with, with this being, this is a message-driven organization. It's a message-driven um, uh, series of artwork. Do you find that that message resonates uh, less strongly, or is its is its resonance uh, uh, de dependent on your proximity to the ocean, or does it, does it sort of uh, does it resonate just as strongly whether you're landlocked as we are, or maybe somewhere like Florida or Oregon that has a coastline? Well, that's a great question, and my strongest introduction to washed ashore actually came in 2016 when in my role at Denver Zoo, I was able to bring an exhibition of 19 sculptures to our park and host Washed Ashore there. And we were the first inland zoo to have Washed Ashore come. So um, at that point, and now in my new role, I've really been able to um, dig into the science and learn from others and apply what we've learned to see that, you know, rivers are where a lot of this pollution actually originates. It may actually be in a parking lot at a big box shop where something gets left in the, in the parking lot, a piece of plastic, a cup, a water bottle or something that ends up getting uh, in a storm into the storm drain, which leads, at least in our examples here in Denver, right to um, our Platte River. Rivers to oceans are um, ways that all of us are connected to this issue. And so while I think at first, many inland folks like myself uh, saw this and thought, oh, really, we didn't have a connection in Denver to bring this. We really worked hard with local partners who are really into river conservation 
to collaborate and look at how this issue does often originate inland and make it more relevant to all of our guests who were visiting the, ex the exhibit at the zoo. And that's what uh, talking with all of the folks so far at Chattanooga, they're well aware of this concept and doing a lot of amazing research and actually um, looking at ways to help make sure this message does then really um, become relevant, if not already relevant to folks there in, in the community around the aquarium. Working with uh, a message in mind uh, inherently sort of adds kind of creative uh, constraints. You're kind of working within with a, an end goal in mind. Um, but to see these pieces, uh, and you've got some great examples, obviously, in uh, your virtual background there, uh, you would <laughs> never guess, you know, they're, they're so whimsical and colorful and large and just they're fun. You would never guess that they were created uh, with this creative constraint of having to work with repurposed plastic in mind. Yeah, so I like to say it's an ugly problem with a beautiful solution. <laughs> now we're about ocean conservation through art. And so the constraints of the media, so the types of plastic that actually washes up and we have, are something that our lead artist, Steve Wright, actually um, does have a, as a constraint. So while we may want to make a supersized pink or orange um, sea star, those are a species that are um, in many places suffering strange die-offs in the ocean, uh, that, those colors are less abundant actually in what we, probably what we produce, but also what's then just coming in um, back into the shore. Whereas other colors like black and white, blue, some of those are much more abundant. And uh, so the, the message and what species we may wanna create or really work to make sure we're, we're focusing on, sometimes are limited by the actual materials that we do have available. And we're relying on the waves and the tide and all of those things, bringing it forward for people to collect it and then drop it off at our um, uh, drop off locations along the coast. As you're beginning to contemplate working on a new sculpture, uh, what's, what's the origin of the idea? Like how do you do concepting and then uh, maybe assembling parts and pieces? How, do, how does that all work? Well, it depends on sort of some upcoming locations or themes. So for example, Nora the Salmon did debut in Denver uh, and it was the first piece that really had a freshwater connection for our founder to create. And so that really was an example to bring a species that spends part of its life in freshwater and part in the ocean to really to their exhibit to be able to reinforce this river concept. So that's sometimes where the ideas come from. Sometimes it's just, we think they're fun. <laughs> you know, we have this amazing longhorn cowfish that uh, is really whimsical. His, his name is Angus. And uh, this cowfish actually was inspired by a big yellow buoy that had washed up and sort of just our artist really could start seeing lines and cutting things in ways that helped inspire them. Others are with partners who really um, are wanting to sponsor or commission something uh, such as a seahorse we're getting ready to work on. Others are some things that we really wanna highlight the message of. So. Um, a great hammerhead shark is one that we're brainstorming funding for because that's a species of shark that is so unique and different. They're not in a lot of um, aquarium uh, care. And so those types of species have, you know, kind of a little bit of a mythical quality to them. They're so interesting looking and they're also endangered in many parts of their range ac across the globe, global oceans. So it's kind of a mix, but that process then um, often comes about with research. We look at the species. Uh, we were, for example, with the uh, hammerhead, we found a researcher in the Bahamas who does work on that and was uh, delighted to collaborate with us on our uh, drawings and the process to help make sure we were you know, doing justice to the natural history and the, the look and feel of the creature. But then really um, our, our artist takes uh, that design to a welder or he himself is a welder, but in this case, the sculpture is large as we imagine trying to create this hammerhead shark. It actually, uh, we outsource it to a local uh, individual who uses stainless steel uh, metal. So we found that the ocean when we're 
having these sculptures outside, the seawater and the elements often are heart of them. So that's something that's not washed up that's part of these sculptures is the internal frame. So I kind of liken it to an artist who uses a canvas you might buy <laughs> and what goes on the canvas, the paint, the acrylics, the other applications of media for us then become a plastic that's washed up on the beach. So after the frame is constructed, we've just begun um, moving away from using some washed up plastic to actually working with our welder, whose son is a race car driver. And before these tires were all going in the land, uh, Phil, we've actually found a use for used race car tires to become the skin. So the sculpture then receives a skin of race car tires over this stainless steel frame that really becomes an amazing uh, receptor to the screws that then our artist uses to put the plastic on. And then from there, he goes to town with the vision that he's created around the materials. We do often cut uh, the plastic down so it's not all whole pieces you'll see. Um, but the last and final thing is both making sure the eye is really um, spectacular. We want these creatures to catch your attention, not only from their size and uh, um, the, the overwhelming sort of presence they have, but then by looking at you. And so the eyes are something that our founder and our lead artist both have really carried on. Uh, he's carried on that tradition of making eyes that are really attractive and phenomenal and sort of speak to you, as well as then including recognizable items that have been collected. That may be a shoe or a golf ball or a toothbrush, or sometimes it's weird things like, how did it get in the ocean like a toilet seat? Um, all sorts of these things that then really help make these sculptures even more relevant because we all use plastic in our lives every day. As hard as you try and avoid it, it's really the point of the message is to make everyone aware of this and work to reduce our impact on the planet through eliminating plastics in our lives or disposing of them properly, recycling if that's an option where you are, or in many cases, I'm repurposing them into things that uh, we can use them over and over. So it's kind of beginning to end to the inspiration point of when they're on exhibit somewhere uh, and then traveling around the country. It's funny that you mentioned the um, the kind of Easter egg element to it, that the, the closer you look, the more of these unexpected items you find uh, kind of the, in the makeup of each of these pieces. It almost sounds like when you go to an art museum, if anybody has been um, very close to uh, something that was maybe painted in acrylic, you can you can see the the texture of the the brush. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one of those things that the closer you get, the more you see. It's very interesting that it also applies to plastic as much as it does to acrylic paint. I, I'm hoping there's opportunities for guests at the Tennessee Aquarium based on where these are located to both get really distant views of them because seeing them from afar is one really more remarkable experience. And then, like you said, getting up close to see those individual items, to recognize those things that we have in our daily life is a really exceptional experience. And all of the graphics that are part of our um, sculptures have this um, I spy aspect, especially for youngest guests, to really look for and hunt for things that are recognizable. Um, and especially we try and look at things that um, within reason are really things that kids have some control over. Uh, I was just in Vancouver, an exhibition there, and we're able to talk to kids about some of the elements such as sand toys. So sand toys at the beach or your flip-flops at the beach are something that we can all be responsible for and make sure end up going home with us or, or the waves, they're not left so close to the water that the waves come and take them and actually sweep them out to the sea. So while it's largely an adult problem and issue, there are things kids can do. And, and these I spy elements, seeing these little recognizables are great ways to really help them to see that there's a role they can play in, in making sure their stuff doesn't end up in the water. We are gonna have 13 of these sculptures at the Tennessee Aquarium, but it's not, and they're spread throughout our campus. So you, you mentioned, where will you be able to see them? They're actually, will be all throughout our campus. So if you've never been to the Tennessee Aquarium, we have two main buildings, the River Journey and Ocean Journey buildings, as well as the IMAX 3D theater, and then a plaza that fronts those buildings. So the sculptures will kind of be throughout that experience. There'll be some that are outside, some that are inside the IMAX, as well as throughout both the River Journey and Ocean Journey buildings. 
but it's not just 13 pieces. It, it's 13 sculptures or 13 works, but it's not 13 individual pieces. Can you talk a little bit about um, how some of these are actually collections of, of pieces that make up one work? Yeah, some are uh, masks. So one of the early ways our founder was uh, sort of experimenting and playing with this media with washed up plastic was through masks. And so there's some compilations of that early work that are uh, exhibited as um, one piece that are within a multiple of masks. And I think maybe by the IMAX, there may be a space where those might be exhibited. The other piece that I really love are, are a bloom of jellies. So, so sea jellies, there's a bloom of them as a group is called that I believe will be uh, exhibited there as well. So some of them actually go together and are really even more impressive when you see a group like that. What is your favorite thing about uh, seeing people experience these sculptures for the first time? I mean, I'm sure you've probably been there to see them installed and see people's first reactions. So what do you love most about watching people take them in for the first time? I think the process of, again, seeing them from afar and just seeing these really beautiful sculptures and then not realizing until you get closer that first time to go, oh my gosh, no, that's actually plastic. And that's a, that's a, a rice server. Uh, the folks, especially there's a lot of immigrants from Asia and Vancouver, there's a penguin that's there on exhibit that right on the chest is the rice uh, server. So there's certain things that for uh, all of us that we use in our daily lives that really resonate with folks and that experience of them finding that thing for a guest and going from a beautiful sculpture down to wait, what is this about? What, where did all this come from? And really sparking those questions and um, causing them to be really curious is really something that for me is a part of the process that I really enjoy. And then you get the chance to really talk to them and share that this is coming from, this is just one spot in Oregon where this is washing up and really largely 10 or 11 years worth of, of plastic. And this is something happening all over the globe. And so we're doing this to raise awareness um, to really, again, look at how we can uh, individualize our behaviors around plastic and make some changes, even if it's just one, to improve uh, or reduce the amount of plastic that could end up in the ocean. One interesting thing about Washed Ashore and its impact that it has already had on us as an institution is we were inspired so much by the work of Washed Ashore and these sculptures that we actually, as a staff, set out to create one of our own. So we have a brook trout uh, that has been created using plastic that was um, donated or collected from uh, within uh, the institution, within the aquarium. So it, it has already had that impact on us and it's gonna be very interesting for us to see them uh, in person as well as to see uh, how the public here in Chattanooga responds uh, to these pieces that again, are so whimsical and colorful and impactful and, and eye-catching. And then as you said, the closer you get, the, the more you're gonna see. Someone did tell me about that brook trout and I'm so excited. Um, I think I've seen images of it too, of it coming together. And it's that type of spark that I love when washed ashore coming to, to an uh, organization can really bring. We've seen schools where they've created similar works and we've seen all sorts of community projects kind of come up around this or sustainability measures and reviews within different um, places where we're going to be, which are also wonderful things we love to spark. And so I have to admit, it happened to me. When I, when I had washed ashore at Denver Zoo, I suddenly realized these little plastic containers that I use every day to clean my contacts in are not recyclable, or at least don't have the recyclable sign on them. And they're something that you have to use and uh, add more solution to, and then uh, they, they lose their effectiveness. And so I go through all of those and it's that reading glasses, sunglasses, there's things that are just uh, part of my plastic choices that I couldn't get disposed of properly, or I should say couldn't recycle. Uh, and so I started collecting them and I still am packing stuff away. And in fact, entered some art contests myself uh, with these materials at our local county fair um, I don't know, 2017 or 18, I guess. And so it really can 
hit you uh, in different ways. And so I'm really excited that I believe the goal is that every staff member will contribute at least one piece or, or help in everyone will help in some way contribute to that sculpture because it really is a powerful way to then see how everyone is part of this problem. Yet even better, it means that everyone can then help contribute to the solution. And that's what Wash to Shore is really trying to do is really spark a movement to really look at ocean conservation through art and, and really implore folks to join us, help us out. This is really something we all need to take on. So with that, I guess I will say to you, Brad Parks, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us and walk us through the origins, the mission, uh, the how and the why of Washed Ashore, which again is a art project, an art install, a series of art works that will be coming to the Tennessee Aquarium beginning April 16th, and will be on display here at the Aquarium throughout our campus through October 30th. So again, that is tax day through Halloween, roughly, uh, give or take a day or two on either end. And uh, we are very excited to have that uh, come to us and to see how the public responds to it. But Brad, thank you again so much for taking the time to talk to us and uh, for giving us your insights. You're welcome. I look forward to seeing it in person. I'll be there for the opening to meet the staff and the folks who are excited about it, as well as guests and members of the community.